Well, good morning, dear colleagues, and welcome to the second day of Euro SDR workshop. In the next 15 minutes, I'd like to introduce you to the different areas of work of the Swiss Topo image collection. More information on the image collection can be found on the Swiss Topo website. Swiss Topo has been documenting Switzerland's topographic development for around 175 years, preserving various geodata and making it available in the form of time series has resulted in a landscape memory of Switzerland, which traces all the changes and developments over a long period of time. Based on the documentation of past developments, it is possible to draw conclusions regarding the future development of our living space and changes in the natural environment. The image collection is part of several related collections. Swiss Topo also holds an extensive map collection, a collection of working instruments, tools, and geological and geodetic collection items. In this presentation, I will only focus on the image collection. The analog collection contains more than half a million photographs taken over a period of around 100 years, in color, black and white, and infrared, on various photographic media, in different photographic formats, and with changing photographic techniques. The last analog photographs were taken in 2010. Within the collection, there are three different thematic collections, aerial images, <coughs> terrestrial images, and technical photographs. Our photographic images of the landscape were primarily used to produce maps or to update national maps. Today, the photographs are used in many different ways. As a unique national cultural resource, the image collection allows us to observe, study, and document the development of settlements and landscapes in Switzerland over the decades and is thus an important part, as I said, of Switzerland's landscape memory. Swiss Topo has the legal mandate to preserve and manage the historical image documents and their contents and to make them accessible to the general public. In order to fulfill this mandate, the concept for the processing of the historical image collection has been developed in recent years as well as a plan of measures for the rea realization of the project. So we started in 2008. The image collection will be made fully accessible to the public online. I will start with the largest of our collections, the aerial photographs. In the, collections, they are, in the collection, there are mainly vertical images, <coughs> excuse me, vertical images, but also a small number of oblique photographs. The collection period for the aerial photographs stretches, oh, me, stretches from 1926 to 2010. Merci. After this time, the analog collection was completed. Since 2010, only digital image strips were created. Within the collection of aerial photographs, there are again sub-collections. These are aerial photographs as a basis for the various map series, as well as commissioned photographs taken in connection with thematic flights. The photos encompassed the entire country and were taken at regular, in, at regular intervals. The scale of the images usually varies between 1 to 20,000 and 1 to 30,000. They are available in black and white for a period from 1927 to 2003 and in color from 1998 to 2010. That physical collection includes black and white glass plate negatives, black and white and color and infrared plastic films, and more or less a double quantity of paper prints. And here are some examples of aerial photos. The first one is from 1936, and here an image from Zurich, from 1957. Here you, oh, yeah. here you see the Jungfrau region in 2005. <coughs> Since 2010, Swiss Topo has no longer produced analog individual images. These have been replaced by digital aerial image strips. After World War I and up to the beginning of the 1950s, much of the Alpine region was topographically surveyed using terrestrial photogrammetry. Here, Swiss Topo topo topographers used the approximately 7,000 broadly distributed survey points, measured the position and altitude of each 
location with the aid of a photo of a light, which is a combination of a serving instrument and a camera, and captured photographic images on about 57,000 glass plates. Here, a terrestrial image from 1932. It's a view on the Moiri Glacier. And finally, let's look at the last them thematic collection, the so-called technical <coughs> images. Here you see the engineer de Rémy taking measurements at the Mont Salvant re Reservoir in 1921. The technical photographs are a separate co photographic collection of high documentary value integrated into the image collection. The oldest pictures date back to 1882. The focus of the subject areas changed several times over the decades. Initially, man mainly church and house towers, mountain peaks, pyramid and pole signals were photographed. Later also, the employees of the Office of Topography and their working methods and tools. <clears throat> Here is one of the technical images. It shows the survey assistance during the Rhone Glacier survey of 1882. The original is a glass plate negative in the format 9 to 12. This picture shows the operation of the series aerial imaging camera in 1954. Because the survey aircraft could always fly higher as a result of technical progress, and consequently larger and larger areas were shown on the aerial photographs, the, com the camera operator had to work with the oxygen mask until the introduction of pressurized cabins. And this is how you can, can imagine the image collection before treatment. A wide mix of media, techniques, materials and information. Notice also how um, the photographs were previously stored in the archives. These storage conditions are very bad for photographic documents. These types of packaging materials and the pollu pollution accelerate the decay of the documents. So what is our job? We reorganize the collection and media and record them systematically. We process the information contained and make it accessible to the public. We also prepare the fragile photographic originals for long-term storage. Cataloging includes the collection of metadata and its ma management. A photographic image without the associated meta information is of limited value to the user. Along with digitization, the cataloging and indexing of the contents of the collection ensure their availability and usability. Here on the picture you can see an example of, diverse, of the diverse source material on the collection that we are currently working on. In all these documents, we find important meta-information about the images we are cataloging. And the images will be published on an ongoing basis so that in the future, the entire digitized image collection will be accessible to the public online easily and in the best possible quality. To make this possible, there is a need for innovative solutions tailored to this type of survey image for cataloging and distribution. Thanks to the close cooperation, specialists from different areas of Swiss Topo, it is possible to develop such complex application within the federal office. So we collect metadata from the historical sources with acquisition tools developed specifically for the various collections inside the image collection into database solutions developed specifically for this purpose. The images are also geo-referenced and we currently publish one to two images of a flight line on the crowdsourcing platform Snapshot. So experienced volunteers then locate these images, we adopt the information and use it to automatically locate the remaining images of the line. <coughs> we then check the positioning and correct it if necessary. Age-related decay and frequent use threaten a large part of the precious originals. We preserve the original historical documents in order to be able to store them for the long term. Swisstop is committed to preserving the originals in order to enable future generations to access the original information. This includes the cleaning and repackaging of each object in archive quality packaging material and subsequent storage and suitable repositories. All analog photographs are subject to a continuous process of decay from their date of manufacture. The nature, manner and speed with which the age-related deterioration processes take place are determined by the composition of the photographic materials, their processing, we saw this um, yesterday, and the storage conditions. The following pictures show damage that can occur if photographic materials are handled incorrectly. So these are um, pictures from our collection.
We saw this yesterday. These are uh, fingerprints. This is not from our collection yet. <clears throat> An important step in connection with long-term preservation was to initiate the inclusion of the collection in the list of cultural assets of national importance in Switzerland. This classification underlines the importance of our collection and its safe and long-term preservation. It gives us the necessary legal backing when, as is, as is currently the case, there is talk of cutting off the power supply to the buildings of the federal administration and thus also the air conditioning of the cultural property rooms due to a possible power shortage. In the context of the preservation of Sistopo's cultural heritage, we were able to build a storage room at an external location for our most sensitive items. The room is located in a former military defense facility deep inside one of Switzerland's mountains. The advantage of a cavern at such a location is, among other things, that the naturally prevailing climate is already very stable, without further measures. This in turn is a big advantage should, be, should the electrical systems such as air conditioning fail. On these pictures you can see a part of a corridor leading to the storage room and the door to the pre-chamber of the room. Inside this room the air conditioning system is located. In a location like this, it is also easier to create a stable, controlled, artificial indoor climate as there are less external influences present. In these pictures, you can see the devices for cooling, humidifi humidification and purification of the air. They are located, as mentioned, in an area outside the storage room. This is important in view of possible failures in the technical installations, such as short circuit, water leakage and so on. And here you can see the entrance to the storage room in, and an interior view of the cavern. At this location we store our cellulose acetate and nitrate films which have already been completely reconditioned, digitized and made accessible. It is therefore what we call in German a silent archive. The room is kept at a temperature of 5 degrees Celsius with a humidity of around 40%. The air is filtered and regularly exchanged to remove the harmful decomposition products of the film material. The climate is constantly monitored and immediate intervention is provided in the event of a system failure. Fortunately, we do dispose of a redundant system and we also have an emergency power generator, which is in these times a big advantage. Another important step in the context of preservation and accessibility is the digitization of all images, which is carried out in-house at Swiss Topo. The images are scanned with the photogrammetic precision scanners. This uh, is a picture of the old scanners. We do have newer ones, but I didn't have a photo of that. Yeah. To avoid data loss, the creation of two backup copies, their storage at a secure location, and the regular checking of the data quality of the copies is ensured. The aerial photographs and terrestrial images are published on the Federal Geodata Viewer and accessible online. Images can be accessed individually with associated metadata, full resolution image view and order features. So a download function will be implemented soon. <coughs> the terrestrial images and part of the aerial images, as I said before, are also accessible on the Snapshot platform. Snapshot is both a data viewer and a participatory georeferencing platform. The so-called technical photographs of the image collection are published on the memo-based platform which is called Portal to the Audiovisual Heritage of Switzerland. The memo-based information portal currently enables searches in over 400,000 audiovisual documents from over 90 Swiss memory institutions. More holdings are being added all the time. Now I'm at the end of my presentation and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Holger Heisig. And I will be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end of my colleague's presentation. As in real life, <coughs> my work begins where Nicole's work has ended. So I will present how it's good to have the imagery, it's good to have, know them being preserved for a long time, it's great to have them digitized, it's better to make 
value-added products. Just to show you our area of interest, of course, is um, the Swiss <coughs> national surface. Just to remind you, Switzerland is a small country, about 40,000 square kilometers with 8 pe million people, mainly living in the lowlands. Um, but there's almost half of the country um, dominated by Alps, which makes it for photogrammetric um, purposes or applications especially challenging. Um, imagine that the average altitude of the country is 1,350 meters. Um, there's <laughs> lots of um, land cover like glaciers, lakes, bare rock, etc., which makes it difficult to determine uh, ground reference. Um, nevertheless, the um, national, the image acquisitions for national map updates, um, they started in 1926 with um, the Swiss Topo Flight Service and during those first 20 years um, it was only flown over the lowlands and uh, there was no stereo coverage and uh, the support material were glass plates. After Second World War II uh, they changed to um, panchromatic film, um, systematic full stereo acquisitions countrywide including the Alps. Um, panchromatic film mm -hmm. until 1998 where color film was introduced and uh, you see a little bit below there's also the annual coverage um, shown like they started with around 10% of the country increasing it to nowadays about one third of the country every year and um, uh, then we changed in 2005 to that digital ADS system. Um, we have the national auto image um, in color, or this, it started with the color film, so we have a live production, if you want, from 1998 on. But then we have those rich archives and we retrospectively um, process them into a um, Swiss image historic um, product and which of course involves all the photogrammetric processes that are required orientation, auto rectification and the mosaic in a course. Um, all this has been treated already this uh, 1946 to 1998 and uh, published and currently we are working on those uh, first generation glass plates between 26 and 46 for the orientation for the whole photogrammetric processing chain. The, this is just the, the overview of the um, processes. We have the originals well kept and digitized metadata central to all of us. That's why I put it in the center. And then there are those consecutive photogrammetric processes, orientation, DSM extraction, I will talk about. Metadata are central. This is why um, they are central not only for documentation but in our case also because we read and write from the different processes. We update the information, for <coughs> example, the orientation, etc. All those elements, it steers the process. The metadata base is also the process if you want. This is just uh, not to go into details but just to show it's a um, <coughs> geo-relational database that means we have geometries, the polygons, the flight lines, the points, additional attribute tables for calibration etc. So that's most important. Um, the part I'm personally most concerned with is the, the orientation process. And uh, it's, we heard it yesterday, it's, it can be difficult and it um, requires quite some human resources to do especially the ground control measurements on those historic images. Um, we have uh, implemented a highly automated photogrammetric workflow which is based on this um, HUB software module. We, already heard a little yesterday about and its um, software provider is uh, Catalyst which is maybe known 
formerly known as PCI Geomatics, and um, it's a, it's not um, a structure from motion, but it's a real traditional photogrammetry inside. It's not a complete black box because the project files, etc., is written in ASCII, and even the um, um, the scripts that run the process they are. It's a Python script, so, so, so you really, they are pretty traceable what it does and how it does. And um, what it does is uh, the, the automation is, uh, of course, uh, automated fiducial detection, automated Taekwondo generation, and what I haven't seen apart from here on, on the software is the automated matching of GCPs. Um, to a provided auto reference. So, our auto reference is from 2015 or something. It's, it's really a recent one um, that we <coughs> have. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the software it requires minimum metadata, like the approximate image positions. And approximate can mean something between one, three, or four kilometers. And it's good to have the focal length, but not much more. And the system it generates uh, abundant number of observations, tie points, S, um, GCPs, and those are filtered <coughs> through iterative procedures of bundle block adjustment. If you are interested in the details, it's in this publication, which is available here. Just to show you an example, this is a very early from, from our current production, uh, like the 1930s, um, this is a typical block configuration. Typical block figure configuration means between 400 and 800 images for me. Um, this is even multi-epoch, so it was like two complete coverages from 31 and 45, which are in this block. And we use, we call it additional images, depicted in red here, to um, geometrically buffer the block. And uh, of course uh, from that time there is no calibration protocol so we kind of empirically determined um, at least the position of the fiducial marks. And this is what the tie point generation can look like, well typically looks like, it can be, <coughs> should be very dense, maybe this is after the second generation you see there's a hole in the middle that can be due to land cover like a huge lake or something or maybe to a but if it's not a lake you can complement just with a handful of manual tie point measurements and rerun the process and you have the same density everywhere and these are the ground control points so you see again it's abundant <coughs> abundant number of um, observations and um, I never look at what has been matched. It's more a statistical approach. We know that those are non-precise measures. And we run um, bundle block adjustment and uh, then we take a look at the residues of the ground control points and filter them based on those residues. And uh, the average accuracy and orientation we obtain through this process is about one meter in X and Y and rather two meter in Z. What's um, maybe surprising at the moment or at the beginning is that the residuals of the GCPs can be much larger, is rather three to five meters. So I understand it this way this is what you do in traditional photogrammetry. You work, you measure few GCPs as precise as possible, which should be as precise as possible. What we do is this. We have poor precision, but still you can obtain a good accuracy if you have a large number of observations. Next point is uh, DSM extraction. Um, it's not a product, but we calculate one, I calculate it in the orientation process to validate the quality of the orientation. Because then uh, I do a difference 
with the reference DTN, and if the difference is low, the orientation cannot be bad. So this is just, really just a scratch thing calculated on the pyramids. And um, what you see in white is that we have a difference of less than 2 meters to our reference. Just to remind you, this is acquisitions from 1950 without any cal calibration protocols. Um, the black triangles are the images, the black lines are the flight lines. And um, what's green is and red is changes or higher differences. And we've seen that already yesterday, or you may recognize this big structure here is the largest glacier in the Alps, the Alps glacier. And of course, uh, we have a huge difference which can be used by glaciologists or which glaciologists are interested in. Next is auto-rectification process. There's not much to say about because it's completely um, automated. So after the orientation process, we write the orientations to the database. And then, as I said, from the different processes, we read the orientation elements, internal and external orientation elements, to calculate um, our autophoto. Just a remark here, it's based on a current or on a recent DTM because we don't have a historic DTM as a product. Mosaicing, not much to say about. You all know AutoVista, automated um, scene line generation. Um, for me here, just to mention that we did some quality assessment on the accuracy of a final product, which is for this example from the 1980s, one meter, including two outliers, which are clearly on unstable terrain in the Alps. So if you remove them, it would be even a little bit better. A radiometric homogeneity, of course, is uh, good, is important. And this is just to show you for this period, 1946 and 1998, the number of different mosaics you have for each tile just in function of how often it has been acquired or flown for the national map updates of course there's, it's not the same everywhere but the mean value here is close to 8 that means for one example for example Zurich Airport you can see for each year um, how it developed and uh, you can add another 10 or so images from the color mosaic and you have quite a nice time line. Dissemination, of course, is good to have products to make them. It's even better to disseminate or to bring it to the user. Um, big game changer, big milestone for us is that since last year, most federal data are open government data, which includes all our historic images and derived products. No license fees apply and no restrictions on use whatsoever. So every um, one who is interested can needs currently to order those imagery through the customer service, but there's no license fee. And as Nicole already said, there's a download service planned. And on that website, you can um, query metadata and see full resolution images and mosaics and the mosaics, they are already available as a WMTS. It's good to have data, it's good to have products, it's even better to have applications. I just want to highlight very shortly um, some national, nationwide applications. And one is here, the countrywide land use, land cover statistics, which are performed by the Federal Office for Statistics. It's called Areal Statistic and on a point grid all over the country of 100 by 100 meter, each point's land use, land cover is determined. It is assigned into one of those 72 classes. You see here only the aggregate classes. And um, it's being produced on recent data, but also on two cycles on historic aerial images. And mostly or for a big part in 3D and those um, time series uh, allow for to track changes of course and this is just an aggregate 
you see on the left side, for example, like in every most other European country, settlement area has grown. But the question is, at which cost of, of which land cover class, for example, you can answer here easily that it's mainly agricultural areas that were used for new settlement areas. Um, another countrywide application is the calculation of digital surface model. We heard yesterday Mauro Marti um, tell everything much more detailed than I could or would, um, so no need to <coughs> stand to, to, to rest there. This is just the third example I wanted to show, even though this um, workshop is archiving historical aerial images, we heard that we also have terrestrial images, stereoscopic and terrestrial images. So, the, um, as Nicole said, the, the, the positions from where the images have been taken are um, known, they are documented. <coughs> so the external orientation of those images was known or is known and now there's been a study from glaciologists from the ETH Zurich who used tens of thousands of those images to produce a DSM covering the whole Swiss glaciers, the whole Swiss Alps and they used it for the change detection for to quantify the glacier melt. It's a very interesting paper in case you're interested. Um, for to summarize, we do a very we do a systematic processing of historical aerial images at Swiss Topo. I, there's also an upcycling um, aspect in this because we can nowadays derive um, digital surface models much more precise with our uh, digital technologies than ever could be imagined at the time the, <coughs> the images have been acquired. We have a highly automated photogrammetric workflow implemented and uh, for us it's uh, five to ten times more efficient than the conventional approaches we used before while it provides similar not, if not better quality. We do this processing <coughs> centralized at our premises um, and, ST, and we esteem to be it economically sound because it avoids redundancies at the customer side and it fosters the establishment of our production scale. All derived products are published through our national geodata portal and important applications on national level are established. Implementation of OGD principles um, we have have already experienced that, increase the use and demand of historic air photos and derived products. With that, I would like to <laughs> close. <laughs>
a forestry company or anything else. Uh, we do uh, raw scanning of our, all our images, which means we don't uh, do any pre-processing in uh, the scanning procedure. We scan the data that uh, there is. In the second image here, you can see one of our negatives, and we have a black strip of paper on uh, the left-hand side of the image. This is the border to Norway, which is marked for confidentiality. We all uh, through the years, images have been marked and masked for confidentiality. You can mark uh, any secret places or military intelligence with a marker pen or stuff like that. We, when we scan our images, we aim to preserve all data there is. So we clean all the images thoroughly, remove any <coughs> confidentiality review on the images as we scan them. <coughs> if there needs to be any confidentiality review done afterwards, it will be done digitally in another process by another function at our authority. We have three Leica DSW 700 scanners, which we scan all our 23 by 23 centimeter images. We also have uh, a delta scan scanner for our 30 by 30 negatives, which are older. We post-process all the images in an in-house creative <coughs> software called the Curb, where we can adjust images either one by one or strip by strip in brightness, contrast or color. So you do the radiometric adjustment on the raw images to uh, put them on our digital archive. When we scan the images, we scan them in 12 bits, but after they have been processed in the curve, they are stored in 8 bits as a final image. We also store the raw data. We are 17 people working <coughs> on the roster in uh, our scanning facility where every day is uh, manned by four or five people driving three scanners and our cleaning stations. We don't only have uh, our negatives in the archive, we also have detailed overviews over our strip. We have flight overview maps of basically our entire national assignment since 1937 and also these strip notes with the detailed metadata about uh, weather conditions, camera, flight altitude, number of exposures, and so on. And all these have been scanned, already scanned and digitized and put into our digital archive. Our main goals for this project and for the archive is to create digital products and uh, make the data available for further use and uh, we aim to finish this scanning project in 2028 when all the images are to be sent to the Swedish National Archive, the Riksarkivet, to for final preservation in a mountain cabin bunker as Switzerland also talked about earlier. All our images have been uh, inventoried and uh, we have changed all our image folders and packages to new non-deteriorating folders for, to preserve the data. And uh, this is uh, a diagram that shows uh, our inventory in the green bars and our scanning progress, our scanned images in the blue bars. We are currently scanning the year of 1989 as we are scanning all the images year by year and uh, we have a few years left until our completion in 2028. There are also some green bars in the early 40s which are our 30 by 30 negatives which are scanned county by county instead of year by year. We also 
handle local metadata for the images. When the images are scanned, every image is given an approximate center coordinate in a WebGIS system, and uh, all the flight metadata from the strip notes are also read and put into our database. We currently have a project ongoing with the OCR reading of these flight notes and strip notes to put into the database. And this gives us very connected data where you have the image name, the strip note name, and the key in the database all connected so you can always find the corresponding data for whatever you are looking for. Our geoferencing is a bit further ahead than our scanning procedure. We have georeferenced a lot of images or way past 1989 and into the early 2000s. This is because our national assignment is uh, mostly georeferenced from these strip flight overview maps and uh, not from uh, the scanned exposure image itself. Even though they are already georeferenced from our, our maps, everything is also being controlled where you have an operator looking at the image and comparing it to the center coordinate when we have, when we have done the georeferencing. Uh, after we have scanned and image processed, we are also doing historical orthophotos in applications master from info. Uh, we are only doing this for the national uh, images taken in the national assignments, not for ordered flights. Uh, when, when we do produce the orthophotos, we are using a height model with a 50 meter grid. And the historical orthophotos have a resolution of half a meter. Uh, in Sweden we have two layers of orthophotos, uh, one 60s layer and one 75s layer. Uh, and the, the years the images are taken are for a 60s layer about uh, 55 until 65. Uh, but in the northern Sweden, it's uh, it's almost uh, it's it's hard to take uh, photos. So in the northern part of Sweden, we were uh, using late, uh, more recent taken images, and uh, therefore when we get to the 71st layer, which are images taken between uh, 75 and. Eight, 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 70 and 80, uh, we are not going to complete the whole country because then we should use the same images as in the 60s layer. Uh, and the, the 60s layer are uh, ready for, for some years ago and the 75 layer are almost ready. Uh, after Completing our 75th layer, we are going to start doing annual historical orthophotos. Uh, the first year we start with is going to be 1985. Uh, and as you can see in the left image, uh, we do not uh, cover all the country uh, within one year. <coughs> uh, but we are uh, going to uh, continue with uh, all years that is possible between 1929 and 2006. Uh, from 2006 we are, have a fully digital production. Uh, when we complete with uh, other years, uh, we hope to cover the country with several years. Uh, and this is uh, the same procedure as our uh, current national assignment. Uh, when we are doing this uh, for 1985, in the left image are uh, uh, an area of Sweden with images taken in 1985. 
in the right image uh, we have completed with images taken in 1984 and 1986. Uh, when we are doing the block adjustment, we are completing with, with years nearby. Uh, but when doing the orthophotos, we are doing this year by year. Uh, in Sweden, we have a confidentiality review of, of uh, images taken from 1950 and more recent. Uh, in this diagram, you can see our invented negatives and uh, the blue bars are the, the <laughs> confidentiality reviewed images. Uh, be before 1950, we are not having to do this confidentiality review because the resolution is uh, not too big and uh, the images is not uh, so good that you can see any objects. In, in this uh, form, you can see our 1960s layer. Uh, this is uh, our confidentiality review from the 60s layer, and these are from our 75 layer. Uh, the bar in the middle is 1967. Uh, in 1967, we have uh, done all scanning, uh, all image processing, uh, all images are confidentiality reviewed, uh, all script notes are digital, we have all, uh, all images georeferenced and metadata in database. Uh, and like 1967, uh, which is all completed, we are going to do with all years before send, sending the images to the National Archive eh, Riksarkivet. Uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions about Lantmäteriet, you can look at our website or, or our social medias. If you have uh, any questions later, you can uh, email us. But uh, feel free to ask any questions now. Hello, my name is Malina, and my co-worker and ladies over here. <laughs> Um, we come from the Danish Agency for Data Supply and Infrastructure, and we are located in Copenhagen. This is just to see that we are under the Ministry of uh, Climate, Energy and Utilities, and we are a part of the Danish uh, Mapping Agency, together with the Geodata Agency. So we are like split in two. And this is just to show our organization, and we are from the Data Bank Department, and this is here we have our archive section. So that's why we are here. Um, this is the agenda of the presentation. I would like just to tell about the journey we had from our physical archive and then to publish our images on our website. So I'll go through the scanning process, due processing metadata and APIs, and then just overall understanding our data. Um, we have approximately uh, 2,300 canisters with negative, and this we have estimated to around 400,000 aerial images. And we have some polyester-based uh, films stored at our own basement at the agency, and then we have around 500 cans with uh, nitrate-based films stored at our fortification, which is a part of the yeah, fortification around um, Copenhagen, and they are stored here because they can, at some decomposed rate, they can self-ignite if they are um, exposed to high temperatures, or if they are very decomposed, they can self-ignite at about 38 degrees, I think. So, yes. And then we also have flight reports, one for each can, and we have some route maps, which is around 
4,500. Um, our data covers both Denmark and Greenland. We have mostly scanned our Greenlandic uh, images so far. <coughs> and then we have these route maps for both Denmark and Greenland. Our oldest images are mostly oblique and around after 1950s the images are mostly uh, vertical. And this is just an example from Ilulisat in Greenland, an oblique image, and then from Bonholm, an island in Denmark which is vertical. Mm. And this is a little about what we want to do with our data. Um, our aim is just to ensure an easy access and distribution to the public, and then also ensure a proper future preservation for the physical um, cans, because we do not have the, the greatest uh, storage facilities right now. So, And then we do all this to support research and public administration and hopefully there's much more uh, who can use these images. Mm, and then the scanning process. We had our scans done by uh, external companies in two rounds. So two tenders was made and um, one in 2015 and one in 19. Um, we have some special uh, condition needed as we started uh, scanning our nitrate-based films, so there were some strict rules on how to manage these uh, nitrate films. Um, but it ended with around 100,000 scanned images, and we choose to scan our oldest image from Greenland first <coughs> to make sure that the decomposition rate of the films would not go further. So. And then we had all the flight reports scanned as well. And then all the route, map, route maps, we have them, them we scanned ourselves. I myself scanned a lot of them on this scanner here at our agency. So. Um, we have also created a data model to uh, manage our metadata. This is a very, um, what do you say? Simple model of it, yeah. <laughs> um, and we have placed our aerial images as a part of our bigger collection with the historical maps. So as you can see, all our historical maps and images have all these attributes here, including uh, some geometry. And then our aerial images have extra uh, metadata for more information about camera and flight height and so on. Our route maps are placed under our other historical maps, so they do not have all these uh, metadata about uh, flight information. But what is important to say is that they both have this route idea, with ID, which is the ID, so you can see which route the images are from. Just um, a little more about the metadata. It was uh, registered registered alongside the scanning by these external companies and some of the metadata we uh, registered ourselves as well for the root maps. Um, and then the geoprocessing, our Im aerial images, they are not uh, processed at all, they're just scanned so they are not geoprocessed. But we have uh, processed our um, root maps with a geometry, so they have like a footprint, and we did that so we can, on our website, we can have a um, search by map, so you can click on a map and find a route map from that. And this is just the examples of the footprints from Denmark and Greenland. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of uh, a route map. You can see all the route lines where the flight have taking the images, and there are all the root IDs, which are this one, and then you can see some of the image numbers mm -hmm. as well. And this is the same if information you will find on the, on the image. So if you just have an image, you cannot locate it without the root maps, so <coughs> the registration of the metadata was very important, so you can link the two and find out where the image is from. This is just an example from Copenhagen with the 
blue lines and images. And then we developed two APIs for our historical maps and images. We have one made for the metadata search and one for showing the maps and images. And our website, historiskrecord.dk, is based on these two APIs. So this is how our website looks like at the moment. You can see all the different kind of maps we have. and. Um, the aerial images are placed in this button here, and our root maps are placed under thematic maps. So if you click on this aerial images, you will get all our images shown. And then you can, out here at the left, you can specify your search by clicking on a specific uh, flight mission or a uh, year or an area. And then we have this uh, search by map up here, so you can, this is not working for the flight, for the aerial images, but this is working for our route maps. And if you click upon an image, you will get to the image where you can see all the metadata and you can uh, download the image. So this is how far we are with our images. We have still a lot of improvements to do. We would like on our website to have a specialized viewer for our images, <coughs> and possibly with the possibility to like scroll through a whole flight route, and then also to have a more view processing of our images, possibly by some automated georeferencing or location of center coordinates for our images in, through image detection or artificial intelligence. Um, we also have an, uh, a service <coughs> in, our, in our agency for our newer in aerial images, this oblique viewer to show aerial images. So we also have thoughts about combining our historical images with these newer images, possibly if we had the resources to get all our images geo-referenced. This is information if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you.